also a you know, catch up. So, um, and that actually should have worked. <laughs> That's the way I introduced myself. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't make Carnegie Hall. Anyway, Eric, please. Okay. Uh, well, it's good to be here. Um, as I was telling Michael before this whole thing began, um, you know, one of the things that I have trouble doing is to write you know, interestingly and, and concretely about numbers because everyone has different studies and they go this way and that way and as a journalist, you know, I try to be modest and don't want to uh, provide bad interpretation. So it's always a pleasure to see, you know, people who both understand numbers and know how to write put it all together and I think that's what we have in, in this book that, uh, you know, it's ultimately uh, both a good read and, and uh, you know, good insight into, into where this industry is headed. Um, you know, ultimately, it's a it's a very optimistic take on, on, on the future of entertainment. Even though you raise you know a lot of issues that are that are you know confounding or challenging to the industry and, and to the establishment, um, I, I want to know the source of, of your optimism, given a, given the hesitancy you, you know from uh, from some of the established players um, who you know may fear recent change because they'll hurt. Profit line. You take that one. I, um, I so I think there, there are two sources of optimism. Right? I think the first source. That, wait, can, can you hear me? Can I get closer to this? Okay. Um, so I think the first source of, of optimism is optimism for for entertainment itself. That I really think we're seeing an explosion in both content and in great content, um, and I think that's good for for entertainment writ large. Um, and then I, I really do think that the, the major players have the raw material to respond effectively to, to this challenge. Uh, one of the reasons we wrote the book was try, try, to try to diagnose the problem in the hopes that uh, it would help them respond to the problem. But, but I think entertainment has always been about using new technologies to tell great stories. It's always been about connecting artists with, with their audience. And it's always been about making bold bets on on creative visions, and, and I think fundamentally those are the three things they need to do to respond to this change. I mean, if you look at it from a consumer's point of view, at some level it really doesn't matter whether it's Netflix or Amazon or Google producing the content or uh, Time Warner or Paramount producing the content. So from a consumer point of view, there's all the reasons to be very optimistic. Technology is making it so easy for us to consume the content the way we want at our, at our own convenience. And if you think about the competition, hopefully that's happening now in the industry, you would think that it's all going to be good for consumers in the long run. But even at the forum, uh, from the forum's point of view too, right? I mean, as Mike mentioned, and I think we talk a little bit in the book, that the traditional firms have essentially dominated this industry for 100 years. I mean, if you look at the history of music, uh, your motion picture, or even publishing, there are just three, four, five firms essentially which have continued to dominate. And there's a reason they have. They have that competitive advantage. They have those resources that has continued to make them successful. So, you know, if they can adapt to this new world, why not? Why not they, they, can, they can continue to be successful in the, in the coming time? Well, that, that's a good segue into my next question. <laughs> In the, the first, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the first chapters of the book really, you know, talk about why the big players became the big players. You know, what advantages they had in terms of scale and the ability to control, you know, everything from from distribution to promotion. Uh, later in the book, you, you you know, it's it's almost you know you're giving advice to, to to these big companies. I guess I guess my question is, you know, why? Uh, you know, what what you know is there really? A, a need for, for big publishers, big studios, big record labels, and is their existence, you know, a fait accompli? Like, like, is it, is it, is it, you know, is it assured? I don't. So, so again, go, going back, one one of the puzzles we're trying to solve in the book is why have these companies who have dominated their industry for the last hundred years? Why is today any different than any of the other technological changes they face over that, over that time? And that, that's part of the argument of the book, is this is different, and this does pose a substantial threat to, to your business. Um, I think, you 
know, again, as, as a good economist, I believe competition <coughs> is, is good. And, and I think a world of a bunch of creators and a bunch of companies competing to, to make great content is better than a world with one or two dominant firms who, who own the industry. So you know, that, I think that would probably be my answer. That I, I think more competition actually is, is better. Is that actually, I'll be a little bit more bored. And I'd say, like you said, is it going to be the large firms who will continue to dominate like they did in the past? I don't know which large firm will continue to dominate, but I actually think that it is going to be a winner take all market, no matter you know, no matter who the winner comes out to be. So look at the online platforms, whether you're on Amazon or whether you're on Netflix or your traditional players, publisher, music, Facebook. They both, if you just look at from a fundamental economic and a market point of view, the size and the scale automatically yields the, the power. So I don't think there is a scope in the market to have five very really dominant online platforms. It's just not going to happen. The network effect, the externality effect, simply is going to lead to, again, some sort of consolidation. So as I said, whether it's going to be a traditional firms, a few of them, which will continue to rule, or whether it's going to be some of the new technology firms, which will, I think it's still going to be, in my view, a few players for the content. Right, but is they, how about the, the studios, the content studios? I mean, obviously, there's going to be the need for distribution platforms, and there's obviously going to be a lot of art and entertainment going to be produced. But those, those, um, is the need for, for scale from a production standpoint still, still, um, you know, quintessential? And it, 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 you know, for all the reasons that they came to dominate in the twentieth century. That's that's the that's the core argument, right? So in, in fact, you know, I feel like I'm teaching. Master students, you know, but the, the question is, why have three to five firms dominated the motion picture industry, the music industry, and the publishing industry? And actually, Matt, as a former student, is nodding his head. Um, the I think the answer is, if you look at it, the reason you've had a small number of firms dominate these industries is because they could control the scarce financial and technical resources necessary to create content. They could control the access to the scarce distribution channels. They could get their stuff onto movie theater screens, onto television networks, and onto radio stations. And they could use copyright law to create an artificial scarcity, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, an artificial scarcity in how people got access to content. The argument we're making in the book is none of those three things are as scarce as they once were. It's no longer as hard to make content. You can put anything you want to up on Amazon, and copyright law screws up every one of the industry's existing ways of making profit. Uh, that's that to me is, is the core challenge they all they all face. And yet they're really good at creating content. They have deep contacts within the industry. Um, you know, so so that that to me is the tension. I think uh, you know even in the past we had very powerful distributors. So the Walmart's of the world dominated. I think what's new here, or at least I think my view, is they never worried about, they never thought of going into work, you know, upstream integration to say, let me make the content. On the other hand, if you look at the online platform, Netflix being the, you know, the most obvious example, is they are dominant player in distribution. And they said, well, let me see if I can actually make content. Some of it was probably just the need, because they realized immediately that the content providers are unwilling to license the content out to them unless and until they actually establish a little bit of power and some negotiating. Uh, but your point is, is production a commodity? Uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, you know, I don't have a good answer for it just yet, whether, whether you need deep skills to be a very excellent you know, content creator, or can you actually <coughs> hire people from, you know, you know, from outside and say, hey, I make a great content. My competitive advantage lies in distributing this content. My competitive advantage lies in this, this loyal consumer base that I have. And I'm just going to exploit that to then go ahead and you know, hire people to make content. And I think that's, it's still playing out, I think. You talk a lot about you know, the decision making um, that, that a lot of uh, entertainment companies uh, confront at, at, this, at this point. And well, one of the, you know, the key issues that, that you've indicated is whether it's you know to do price discrimination or not. 
um, which is a, a very fascinating discussion for me. I think that, that there are, there's been arguments over the years that, that windowing, you know, the, the so-called you release it in one platform and release it in the, in the next, is going away. But you know, at a certain point in your book, you know, you 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 know, you say that the best way to generate revenue is to is to you know sell sell high to customers who are willing to pay and to sell low to customers who are who are, who are willing to willing to wait. On the other hand. You know, there's other parts of the book where you talk about the consequences of, of, of delaying distribution, um, digital distribution. So how, how do you, you know, square those two things? Right, so I think the, the business model that the industry has always used is based around selling individual content. Um, and, and if you're selling an individual show or movie or album or, or book to an audience who some value it a whole lot, and some don't value it much, much at all. The best way to extract value from that audience is to come up with a version that appeals to the high value people and sell it to them at a high price, and then come up with another version that appeals to the medium value people and come up with another version that appeals to the low value people. And that's exactly what they've done. And that is selling it in the theaters. If you're willing to wait three months, I'll sell it to you on DVD. If you're willing to wait a year and a half, I'll, you can watch it on television, and all you have to do is watch the ads. So that, that is 100% the right way of, of selling the content if you're selling an individual. The, the thing we're trying to point out in the book is Netflix is pursuing a fundamentally different business model. Netflix's business model involves selling you access to 10,000 movies, some, some of which you like a lot and others you don't, some of which you like a lot and, other, and others you don't. The key is you like different movies a lot. Um, so I can sell you the whole bundle for a single price what the economic theory says is that's a much more efficient way of extracting revenue from the market than, than selling through these price discrimination strategies. The second thing we try to point out in the book is that piracy makes those price discrimination strategies just harder to, harder to execute in the first place. You know, it's like all, all the things you've always done to sell content are now much harder to, much harder to execute. And again, I, I feel like uh, you know, the, the piracy, the technology, is making it hard for firms to do price discrimination. That just means that the ability to monetize the content is going down. And I think that's the tension we have, right? I mean, their ability to monetize the content is going down. Then they are figuring out what is the right business model. I mean, music industry is a perfect example, right? You know, 15 years ago, we used to buy CDs. And today, if you ask CDs, I think probably the younger generation will probably laugh at you and say, yeah, exactly. And what is CD? They don't know. But on the other hand, Monetizing the same Spotify-based model is also proving out to be quite challenging. You know, we all agree that the world has moved to the streaming. The business model on the top of it is still, I think it's 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 up in the air. I think you know, they're trying to figure out. So, I think you know that's their ability to monetize has become harder, and you know that's where the in the presence of piracy, in the presence of piracy, and the different technology. But on the other hand, you have, you know, again, Amazon and Netflix who are just giving you a bundle of content. And they don't, they, they don't care that whether you're buying this after an year or consuming this after three months or, or so on and so forth. So I think that's another challenge that the traditional firms probably have. I wanted to spend a second on piracy because that's, I think, one of the most surprising things that I found in the, in, in the book. Um, specifically, you write that in analyzing various studies, you came to the conclusion that, that anti-piracy and laws and enforcement measures were, were kind of effective. Now, I don't think that's too shocking to you know those maybe in Hollywood, but I, I, I've always sensed that there's been some sort of resistance to, to, the, to, the, to that proposition from the tech community. But my question really is, you know, as Netflix, um, you, um, let me let me also say that you say that anti-piracy enforcement has to go hand in hand with making making things convenient for for that, that, that there's going to be a consumer friendly approach towards uh, you know battle, battling piracy. So I wanted to ask you if you take a look at Netflix, who obviously you, you, you like, and they are starting to produce their own shows like House of Cards and. and would you recommend that they take that, you know, and be more active on the anti-piracy approach? I don't see the data on it. They really, 
Yeah, but I, but I think that the notion of if I could find everything that is available on Netflix in an easy to consume platform that's free, I personally wouldn't wouldn't uh, uh, steal. But but you can imagine some people might. Um, that's you know I think that that is a challenge to their business. So I think I think it applies to Netflix just as much as it, as it applies to to the traditional. I mean I'm pretty sure this is already happening. Like now YouTube has the YouTube Red subscription service, you know, all the stream ripping that is going on where the audios are now being stream ripped and then put it on a sharing network. I'm pretty sure Google and YouTube themselves would be very much supportive of some of the efforts to stop those, uh, the, the very same thing. So I think like the tech firm, they just don't want to be responsible or at least they don't want to be pointed as a source for you know, creating an environment where people can buy it. But I don't think they will be opposed to, I don't think they're opposed to this idea that copyright theft is probably not a good idea for society for a long time. So, so the piracy thing was the most surprising aspect for me, but I'm, I'm wondering, uh, in going into the research for this book, was there anything that popped out to you as something that you didn't expect? I think for me, the hardest part was the long tail. Um, uh, Anita Elversee has, <laughs> who I have a great deal of respect for, and by, and by the way, I guess I should define the long tail. The long tail is the concept that if you go to a Barnes & Noble superstore, you can find 50,000 books. If you go to Amazon, you can find 5 million books. Does anybody care about the extra 3.995 million books? I think I got that right. Um, and, and what the data say is, yeah, actually people generate a whole lot of value from finding exactly the right piece of content that meets, that meets their, their taste and at the same time, Anita's point is that the long tail is made up of, of low-selling products that, that really don't pose a threat to the blockbuster business model, which I think she's, I think she's right as far as that goes. Um, what we're trying to point out in the book is that it's not the long tail products that pose a threat to the blockbuster business model. It's the long tail processes, if you will. It's, it's the platform that allows you to get really detailed data about customer behavior, help them find exactly the right product, that it's, 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 that, it's that data and those processes that are actually a threat to majors, not the, not the long tail product. How, how is this a threat? I think it's, it's a threat in the sense that our tastes are much more varied and diverse than what you can find or what you could have found in a blockbuster video store. And the ability to help Kevin find exactly the content that he's going to like, which is different from the, the, the content that Matt's gonna like, actually drives a lot of value for them. And if you drive enough value for them, they're gonna keep coming back to your platform and sharing detailed data about themselves, which allows you to serve them better, which causes them to share more data with you. Um, and, and that becomes an important part of, of running the business. Probably I, I just add to this that if you step back the traditional forms, whether it's publisher or labels or studios, they, they always were in the business of selling their content to another business. So they, they sold the content to Walmart, they sold the content to a cable company, they sold the content to theater. They really were never in the business of selling the content to the consumer. You know, of course, they made the content for consumers, so they understood what the consumers wanted, but they actually never sold the content and now these online platforms, really, they are they are expert at selling the content to consumers. That is, they know how to you know delight consumers. So Netflix does everything in its power. Sometimes we might not like it uh, to make us very happy. Amazon does everything in its power to make us very happy. So the, all the tools, features, recommendation engines, everything that they have spent time, money, and energy on is to keep us loyal. But the studios never had to do that. They they never profit. So that process, I think, what, what the book says and what Michael described, that the process of trying to you know, you know, design a content or trying to create the content or trying to distribute the content, which is for this for Sunil only, is really not something the content producer ever had to do. But now we are in the world where, you know, as I said again, that the Netflix and Amazon says, I'm very good at making my customers happy. I know how to make them happy. 
now let me go ahead and start competing with you there. Maybe I have a competitor that you don't have because you never did that. Now you don't even have an ability to do that because you don't own the distribution platform like me. Right, as you know, you know the uh, the exec the studio executives all make decisions based on, on gut feel, right? And and you know I think the approach that you're advocating is one more based on numbers and data and all of that. But ha ha, you know if you're letting the algorithms kind of decide, you know what should be um, you know produced. How, how do you ensure that it doesn't become too programmatic, so that you know so <laughs> so that there, there's enough diversity? argument we're trying to make in the book, and, and it goes back to, how many people have seen the first episode of House of Cards? Shame on you if you haven't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely have to <laughs> But to, so the, the first episode of House of Cards starts with Kevin Spacey's character coming out, breaking the fourth wall, and strangling a dog, right? And what the data tell you is that when he strangles the dog, a whole bunch of people tune out of, of the show. Uh, and in fact, when Bo Willeman, the head writer, presented that episode to his creative team, they said, you can't kill a dog in the first 30 seconds, you're gonna lose half your audience. And, and the story we tell in the first chapter is apparently he went to David Fincher, the director, and said, you know, people are telling me we're gonna lose half our audience, uh, we killed this dog, you know, are you, are you worried about that? And Fincher said, I don't give a shit. And he said, you know, I don't either, and, and so they left it in. Can I say that in the city? Well, I'm sorry. Um, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was this there was this wonderful interview with Bo Willeman and uh, Michael Eisner of Disney, where Michael Eisner said, "If I tried to include a similarly violent scene in an episode of broadcast television, I would have been kicked out. I, I would have been kicked out of the network. I just couldn't do that." And and I think what we're trying to argue in the book is. If, if Netflix were, were trying to put the House of Cards in the Thursday 8 p.m. time slot, losing half your audience would be a terrible thing, and you would want to cut that scene. But Netflix didn't have it in the Thursday 8 p.m. time slot, and so if Kevin tuned out of House of Cards, he was probably going to watch something else on Netflix. And now I know, now I know something important about Kevin. He doesn't like watching dogs get strangled, and, and Matt does. And, and I can use that data to to promote content. So, so I think Netflix is pursuing a, a business model that allows you to create content that wouldn't work in a broadcast channel. And, and that to me is actually good for both creators and good for, for the audience. So I guess a long-winded answer to your question, I don't see them using the data to say, cut the scene. I see them using the platform and the data to say, we're gonna find the content that Sunil really likes and we're gonna deliver it to him. Um, and, and, and it's okay if that content is different than the content that Kevin likes. And you couldn't do that in broadcast for all the obvious reasons. I'd actually go one step further and say somehow this notion that when we don't have data, we have this unfettered creativity, itself is probably, I think it's erroneous, right? I mean, you know, Whoever is investing money in the movie is probably dictating a lot of terms on what should be going into the movie. You know, I'll give you an example. None of you would have seen a Bollywood movie, or maybe you have. Sunil. <laughs> <laughs> you will see lots of dances, you know, it's like mostly they're musicals. And you know, I you will sometimes read the stories in the newspaper that how the producer said, went to the director and a writer and said, I need a song in this movie. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to make money. So He's not making a data-driven decision, but he's making a backfield decision to tell the director that I need this particular piece of content in my movie. I mean, so when we say that data is gonna come and destroy the creativity, I think it's a little bit, it's a little unfair to kind of judge the world because the, judge, the world as it exists is not perfect to begin with. There is a lot of, I guess, unscientific way the content is being driven. If anything, I feel like the data actually might make some of those decisions better when somebody could actually tell the producer and director, this is what actually customers like. Maybe that content, if it goes in, is actually a lot more valuable than you know somebody's gut feel saying, well, I think this is what people like. So while well, I agree that you know the concern, but I, I feel like we are comparing you know, a, a, exactly two words where you know there's nothing in like there is no ideal word. We are, the current world doesn't look all that much better. 
getting the data is a, is, a, is another story, and it's challenging, as you, as you know. I mean, you know, a lot of these companies like Netflix and Amazon don't want to share their share their data. Um, you know, a lot of the companies have tried to launch uh, their own platforms. The uh, the Comcast and NBC thing that tried to launch wasn't very successful, and I think the jury's still out on Hulu. Um, so what should they do? Should they should they buy Twitter? What what what? what? <laughs> or Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> or or Netflix? Yeah, that's right. Week. Um, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, uh, they have one network that they kind of sort of treated like a stepchild, which is Hulu, um, where I think it actually could give a legitimate competition to the to, to the to the Amazons and Netflix of the world. Um, but it's again one of those things. Now, what can you do? Um, I think there are various. Well, I think there are various ways that data can be had. Um, you know, for example, right? We, we talk in the book. Many of the you know Amazon, good example, won't even share data with, with the <coughs> firms about where people are purchasing product from, how many, and so on and so forth. I actually feel that. Um, with a little bit more effort in the how you negotiate your contract, how you how you you know incentivize Amazon to share that data is actually very much possible. In fact, I think I actually anticipate that over the few, few years that it's going to happen. Probably the bigger challenge the firms have is they don't really have the data culture. They don't have sometimes even the skills. So even if you get the data, what are you going to do with it? You know, you never hired the people who actually looked at and made data-driven decisions in a very meaningful way. Uh, in fact, I know we have had some conversations with firms like Amazon, and they actually come and tell me, or, or Mike, or maybe some others too, that even if I give them data, they're not actually going to do anything useful. And Amazon gets the students' yeah, data. And so, so because they feel like they don't hire the right sort of people, there's just that culture of data-driven decisions is missing. So. There are two elements to it. First, they don't have data. That's a challenge, and I think it's a huge challenge. But I think even if they had, they have enough data, but, but I don't think they have the right sort of, right now at least, I don't think they have the skills and the culture at a senior level saying, you know what, we are gonna make decisions driven by data. Even now, a lot of their decisions, I think, are made, you know, people have a lot of experience, and you know, sometimes they do make good decisions. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that, but, but Unlike Amazon, where you know the chief economist of Amazon came to our school and said, look, in our firm, we make no decision without data. So if you tell me that you're gonna reduce the shipping, the, the cost for shipping, if you tell me that you're gonna change this and that, prove in the data that it is gonna work. And if you cannot prove, don't come to me with all these suggestions because I'm not gonna accept any. So you are dealing with that culture versus the other culture where even if you show in the data that lower prices work, the senior manager might still say, you know, but my gut feel says the higher prices really work. And that's it, the discussion ends right there. So I think we are dealing with two challenges here, and they're both significant. Well, in effect, um, so I was, I was in class, I was waxing philosophic, as I normally do, uh, about the parallels between what happened with Moneyball and baseball and what's happening in entertainment today. Um, and this really bright student, it actually might have been Matt, uh, you know, raised, raised his hand and said, uh, yeah, professor, but the Oakland A's only got about a year and a half of competitive advantage from their investment in data-driven decision-making. Pretty quickly, everybody else in the league caught up. Why would it be any different in entertainment? And, and in, a, in a rare moment of classroom clarity, I'm, I'm usually really good at answering student questions as I'm walking back up to my office after the class is over. Um, but in a rare moment of classroom clarity, what I said is, the, the answer is, in baseball, everybody had access to the same data, and everybody had the same gut feel for the culture as, as a starting point. Whereas in entertainment, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they're the ones who own the data, and they don't share that data with anyone. And Amazon, Netflix, and Google are data-driven companies, and, they're, and, and so the studios have to go to this extra level of actually changing that, that's, that to me is why this is so hard. Mm -hmm. Talk a lot about big data, and mostly from a business perspective, but I'm also wondering from a consumer perspective, um, something that you don't really address in the book, which is uh, privacy. Does that factor into this conversation, and, 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 and 
how will that impact uh, you know, the choices that are being going forward? I don't know, how many people are Netflix subscribers? How many people know that Netflix watches everything you watch, what scenes you watch over and over again? <laughs> How many people are troubled by that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the peculiar thing, right? Is, is you know, there's, there's this old line that if you ask 100 people whether they're concerned about their privacy, 99 will say yes. If you ask the same 100 people whether they're willing to give a DNA sample for a free Big Mac, 99 will say yes. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't seem to be that concerned about sharing a whole bunch of data about our consumption, as long as Netflix provides back good recommendations and, and a good service. We, we seem to be willing to make that trade. We can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but you know, if, if consenting adults are willing to share data in exchange for good recommendations, I, I mean, I feel like these forms are becoming so big of data if it were to become public and you know, a lot of laws actually make it very clear that that it's very high it's very difficult for firms to hide such activities over the law that is they cannot possibly abuse for a long period of time I'm sure that something you know a short period of time might or might not happen but these companies now have become so big and you know they have so much reputation riding on it that any bad news in a New York Times that Amazon is misusing our data I think it's probably, the risk is so high that, that you would think as a rational economist or a rational person at least that they will have very little incentives to, to they use our data, but I think they have very little incentives to kind of abuse that data. So I feel, I, I feel reasonably good about it. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was reading something about what is called the Spotify, I don't know how many people have Spotify uh, as, as a social service. There is this, Nowadays, they have introduced, I think, discovery playlist or something. It's a totally machine learning driven effort where all they do is they look at this massive amount of big data to figure out what Eric likes to listen. And they have this playlist every week if the playlist gets updated. And I was reading somewhere, I think maybe in Wall Street Journal or something, that the discovery playlist is one of the most <coughs> beloved features by consumers. People just love it because for many of them, those recommendations are so good. Uh, so, you know, consumers just, we are just lazy. We don't want to search. <laughs> we just want the Netflix and Amazon and, and even New York Times to make our life easy for us so that we can do that next click and find this great content that we are interested in. So, I actually feel that even if we have the privacy concern, and, and Michael mentioned, maybe most of us probably don't even have them. Uh, I think the return that you get from some of these services and features are so large that, that I, I feel like it, it's actually a win-win. Okay. Last question, and I'll throw it out to the, to the audience here. But uh, what are some things that, that you would like to study in the future? What are some great unanswered questions you have coming out of writing this book? So if, uh, if, 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 as an academic, as an academic, one other question that is very much probably <coughs> under the law, uh, and I think uh, I think it's, this is going to be an important question. I think we talked about price discrimination. We talked about the firm's ability to monetize the content and be able to generate revenue has you know certainly suffered. The consequence of that means that the firms cannot produce good content. Is that a good hypothesis that if you cannot make enough money, that you are not going to make very good content? We haven't seen much evidence of that. We really haven't. We don't know how to measure it very well. We don't know what does the, the what do the weak copyrights mean to us as a society. It's great for consumers. I can access the content. I can access the content very cheaply. I can access the content sometimes for free. But what are the consequences to the society at large? I think probably is a question that I am very deeply interested in. Our center is very deeply interested in, and we would definitely think that over the next five years that we are going to pursue it as well. You know, unlike the piracy question where the data is a little bit more available, that question is just a little bit more hard. So, as an academic, that's really what I want to go after, we are going after. We can probably do the extension of the book. Well, I, th I think, yeah, I think, I think that's right. In a, in a, in a single period game, um, 
that, yeah, price equals zero is the socially welfare maximizing outcome. The only problem is, is that if the studios can't make any money, they're gonna stop making movies. Uh, and, and, but but finding, finding evidence for that. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you one that, that's, that's more long term. Uh, I usually, when I, when I talk about disruption in industries, I, I usually end the lecture by saying something like, you know, it's important to recognize that some industries are insulated from, from this sort of technological change. Like higher education, for example, we have nothing to worry about when it comes to technology disrupting our business. And, and the fact of the matter is, you know, we're talking in the book about an industry that looks the way it does because certain resources were scarce, and now they're not scarce anymore. And, and you can make some, some really interesting parallels between what, what's going on in Hollywood today and what's gonna happen in higher education in, in the next five to 10 years um, in terms of, you know, we used to have scarcity associated with my lecture and with the size of people I could talk to at one time, and now those things aren't scarce anymore. Does that change? How does that change the business? And yeah, talk about a perfect storm, uh, you know, a book about the future of entertainment. You know. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm just happy I have time. And, uh, and, I say, and I say that with a wink, exactly. Yeah. And hopefully we'll live that way. <laughs> so I want to throw it out to the crowd here. Anyone um, first? Stand up. Andy Tool from the Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you. Andy Tool from the Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Absolutely. I have not read the book yet. I will read the book, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but just a couple of quick comments and then my question. Um, first, I think that data-driven content is fine when you're trying to recommend it. You're trying to give a menu to somebody. But when you're trying to figure out what should, you know, what things to create in the first place, then you can't use data that's already you know, uh, backward looking or present because you don't know what people want in the future. There's a forward looking aspect to this where data cannot actually inform content. Um, so that's okay. Um, so my, I'll cut to my question. So as somebody who's at the trademark, patent and trademark office, um, I'd like to hear briefly of the role that copyright played in the early part of the industry and how that role has changed to the present day uh, and one thing that really, I, I can't believe I don't know this or feel like I don't know this, is I really can't identify that margin that copyright is, is driving for profitability. And what role is it really playing? I mean, is it just really uh, just the uh, monopoly of distribution? Is it the monopoly of uh, other aspects of the process of the, of the, of the uh, supply chain? Or is it actually an important thing to have a copyright uh, in this process to make money? So I'll take the second question to be, you can take the first question. <laughs> um, I think that this is really, I think that what is the value of that copyright? Um, you know, do we need it? How much of do we need it, right? With, 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 with patent or even with copyright, the abuse also becomes that very common, that you know, as a monopolist, you have been given this for last 50 years, you needed it at that time, we don't know whether you need it to that extent anymore, or you are just now extracting your monopoly rents all the time, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. That just means that you're making it harder for users to find the content, consume the content, you know, make, it, make it harder for them to, uh, to enjoy it the way they want to enjoy because you just want to assert your copyright. Um, but the challenge, which is probably, as I said, it's a little bit more of an empirical challenge, you can theorize how much ever you want, is you know, what does the weakening copyright mean to, to, to our country, to our society? How do we know what is the right level that we want to be? You know, do we want to be at a one extreme or do we want to be at another other extreme where everything is available? You know, let the market compete and you figure it out. Um, I think there's a lot of efforts sort of going on. I think the challenge that we have run into, and I think, you know, not not from a consumer point of view, just as a research point of view, is that over the time, the cost of technology is also shifting so sharply. So take an example of a music. You know, you could argue that the copyright infringement on a music industry had a very large negative effect maybe on the industry that they can't make enough money, and you, know, you can come up with all sorts of examples. But if you look at the number of music that is produced, because it's so easy to produce music, 
right? I mean, I can record a music, hopefully nobody would like to listen to it, but, uh, and put it on iTunes and basically distribute quite readily. So the challenge we have is on one hand, the technology is making the content production and distribution cheaper and cheaper. That possibly means that maybe we don't need very strong copyright laws, as, right? as strong. Or, or as strong copyright laws. But on the other hand, we still haven't understood that all this, what has it meant to us as an industry, our ability to create job, our ability to export our culture, our all sorts of matrices. So maybe an unsatisfying answer to your, to, to your question is that I think the jury is still out, I think. We know that for sure that complete lack of copyright is not a good idea. You know, you can look at all the developing countries and you know, you, you know, the industries are just completely, have never recovered, or completely decimated and still kind of playing a very shallow game only because they just can't make money. Um, but do we need the kind of protection we, we have right now? I mean, I don't know whether that's true either. Uh, so, so, go ahead. No, now I'm trying to remember the first question. The first question is how you're using how you're using data in production, and 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 yeah, and I, I think that's 100 percent true, um, and I think I think that's what we're trying to argue in, in the book is that is that Netflix because it doesn't have scarcity in the distribution channel has this wonderful luxury of taking chances on a whole bunch of things that may or may not pay off. That that they're I don't see them using the data to say cut the dog stragglers. I see them using the data to say, I know who likes Kevin Spacey movies, and I know who likes David Fincher movies, and so this project that might not be profitable, if I didn't know that, I can actually make profitable because I, I know exactly who to promote this content to. And in fact, that's exactly what Netflix did. They made nine different trailers, one focused on Kevin Spacey fans, one focused on David Fincher fans, one focused on people who had watched movies with strong female leads, and they targeted it directly to those audiences. I think the said, said another way, in a world where the where the distribution channel is very scarce, you've got to have gatekeepers to control access to that scarcity. You've got to have people making a decision up front, we're gonna make this project and not this project. In a world where you don't have that scarcity anymore, you can let everything be available and then let the consumer decide what, what they like. And in that second world, you get a lot of things that become popular that you wouldn't have expected would become popular. My, my daughter likes to watch Minecraft videos, people, people playing Minecraft on YouTube. Um, it's not obvious that's a good idea, either for her or generally, but, but, but apparently it works. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think that's, that's the difference we're facing today if you take away that scarcity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Irene Moe with the International Bureau of the FCC. So you've been talking, you've been talking mostly about the U.S. market. I wonder if you step back and take a global view, where the market structures are different, there's a diversity of uh, different kinds of uh, arrangements, and consumers have maybe different attitudes towards privacy or copyright. What do you see happening? I mean, so I have actually studied. Some of the some of my work actually did look at the Indian market where the piracy is actually quite prevalent, and I'll give you an example how the businesses actually respond to you know, you know uh, piracy. So in developing countries, India, China, the home entertainment market just doesn't exist. You cannot sell a DVD to anybody. That's it because there's you know before you go and you know start sell, selling the legal versions of DVDs, everything else is already out there. So what do the movie producers do then? They say well. As soon as the theatrical release is over, I'm going to release the movie on, on, on television so that you can all watch for free and I'll just make the ad driven there. If you are a marketing, you know, that's somebody who believes in weak copyright, you could come back and say, you know what, that's a pretty good business model. Why should we stop piracy? You know, the business has adjusted and now they are making money and, you know, we all should be happy. Why do we care about that the, that the Indian government or the Chinese government cannot control? illegal uh, sharing of DVDs and, and what have you. But we miss the point at the level that their inability to actually generate enough money from some home entertainment also means that some of their movies have very small budget. I mean, if you look at the Indian movie industry, it is one of the largest one. It generates, what, 2,000 movies. 
But if you look at the budget of the movies they have, majority of them would seem like basically peanuts, uh, you know, relative to what the you know, U.S. markets are. And sometimes you wonder why is that the case, but then you kind of step back and you ask, now, <coughs> budget doesn't translate to quality, so I'm not qualified that. But, but you, you, you can easily see that if they had an ability to monetize more, you wonder whether they would have invested that money. Now, they might not have. Like Donald Trump says, you know, my tax money is squandered anyway. <laughs> so they might have not invested that money back in the movies, but at least they, you could imagine that maybe there was a chance that if they can make more money, maybe the quality of the movie, the production, the scale, the, all the things that we associate will probably be a little bit higher. So um, I don't know whether I, I, I answered your question precisely, but but yes, I think international markets are different, and what we at least seem to have learned is that uh, you know some of the big copyright protections, in my view, have hurt those markets more than anything else. So um, the you know the content industry, the movie industry, the record industry has often con been compared to uh, to the oil industry. You know, you have to, you have to drill drill ten wells to get one that actually produces. Um, so my question is in this data, you would expect in this data-driven world you would have uh, fewer dry holes. And the question is, if, is, is that true or is, is there enough data yet to, to actually see whether that's true? So I guess I would, I would argue, for, first we don't know, right? If we, do, we don't have Netflix viewership data, so we don't know how many of their shows have been successful and how many of their shows haven't been successful. I would also argue, though, that Netflix's definition of success is very different than the network's definition of success. So uh, what, what I normally say is in class is if you're a network, you succeed by finding more viewers for the shows you have, right? Netflix actually succeeds by finding more shows that meet the unique needs of the viewers they already have. Um, so I could imagine a show that actually didn't have many viewers on Netflix, but for the viewers it did have, they were saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna subscribe next month because I love this show and I've gotta have it. Um, from Netflix perspective, that's great. Uh, all I care about is whether you're gonna pay nine bucks a month to get, the, to get access to the content next month. Um, so again, they're not mutually exclusive, but I think, I think they have a very different definition of, of success in terms of, I think Netflix is much more about audience engagement and, and the broadcast networks, for all the right reasons, for all the right business reasons, are all about how many people watched the show last night at 8.30. Um, so, uh, I, I, I find the, the analysis that you laid out, uh, um, I find the analysis that you laid out to be pretty compelling and accurate to my experience, um, but what, I, 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 what I'm not able to share yet is the sense of optimism about it. I think partially it's because the background that I come with is that as an artist advocate and um, somebody who comes from the independent music movement and uh, has a different set of assumptions about cultural production than the broader industry, and that you know, so m less of the decision making is motivated by wanting to dominate in a marketplace, it's more about finding business model models that are ultra historically been critical alternatives, uh, elevate, the ability to elevate critical and alternative uh, voices. Political perspectives, and sometimes that's the sustaining particular artistic traditions that are important to a community of people. And uh, experientially, we found that yes, there has been this, uh, as we've shifted away from a tracks and downloads and sa the sales marketplace to a streaming environment, it is moving more in this winner take all kind of direction. Um, and artists who were able to sustain themselves with a particular size of fan base are now having to exponentially increase the um, amount of people that they're reaching. And uh, when we try to talk about this stuff, the tech folks, they, there's, there's two sort of responses. There's the, well, now you have the opportunity to reach this global marketplace. And artists often will be like, well, not really. You know, the stuff that I'm doing just is not going to resonate with that volume of people. Or there's a response that, well, now we have all these data tools that are open up to you. And there's a lack of understanding of the limitations of the utility of that data, particularly for people who are lower down in the food chain. You know, the, the, the benefits of that data seem to aggregate really well for aggregators themselves, intermediaries, your platforms, your Netflixes and Spotify's, and for uh, the large
larger business entities, major labels, major studios. Um, can you offer me any kind of optimistic note for the, the, the little indie rappers who are really just trying to get enough money to get their next gig? I so I, so I was gonna I was gonna give a counter example. I've, I've got a buddy who has a, a band. It's called the Boilermaker Jazz Band. It's actually really good. Um, and 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 he was he was actually singing the praises of, of iTunes. And, and I guess he said one of their one of their songs got really popular in Japan, and they made a lot of you know it, it so it allowed them to find find an audience at least for their stuff. Now. You're, you're right. In a sense, what's happened is we've opened up this global market, and we've had a whole bunch of entry on, you know, so we've, we've increased the amount of people who are consuming, and we've also increased the amount of people who are producing at the same time. Um, and, and I'm not sure which of those, which of those dominate. But I, but I, I do think we're facing, I do think we're, we're seeing a, a, I don't know, a, a golden age of, of creativity and in, in some sense, and I don't know. You, you want to? Can you can you make that more optimistic? I, mean, I, I think this goes back to the I think Eric's question that everybody's trying to figure out the business model. Yeah. Well, I think that's the antithesis of the question. Actually, I think that, that the question is, you know, if everyone's so business oriented, you know, is there room for for vibrant independent art? You know, I I don't hear it these days. Uh, the phrase selling out like I used to. You know, that used to be a, a stain on, on an artist who, who, you know, made deals with, with uh, you know, commercial entities. But, you know, these days it seems like, you know, that's what you have to do to survive. You have to sell out. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe, maybe you do. I don't know. But is it, is it different than what it was five years ago? I mean, oh, yes. Which is, it's, hard, it's harder for the independent artist today than it was five years ago. I, 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 I don't think we get it to say that it's harder. I think they certainly had up to, to get the same kind of revenue from the recorded music product. You have to reach an exponentially larger audience on the streaming platform than they did with the sales. But, but I think that's true for all the artists, whether you are a star or whether you are a small artist. Right, but the difference is the people at the top had the marketing reach. But the, the, historically, the independent music movement was sort of about we don't have to keeping the overhead low, making more on each copy of the thing, not spending so much on marketing, and so it can be sustainable at a smaller scale. Um, now, it, now the pricing flattened out, it's like everybody, every restaurant has to compete with McDonald's on pricing. Yeah. And, and because of piracy, you really don't have a way to monetize your stuff um, through, through the traditional channels. So, so I guess another way, another way of saying it, and to me, one, one of the interesting switches we've seen in music is it used to be that I would do the concert to sell the album, right? And now I'm almost giving away the music as a way of selling selling the live the live show. Um, I don't I don't I don't know that I have any data or we have any data on whether that is is decreasing the overall. I mean, I don't know whether the platforms are to be the reason or they should be blamed for it versus the consumer. So the way I think about it is, you know, a lot of consumers are just conditioned to not pay for, think about online, you know, news market. I mean, unless you're a Wall Street Journal or New York Times, really, I mean, you just can't monetize that thing anymore. It's just because people are unwilling to, so the Spotify, I'm sure Spotify would love to, for people to move to subscription service, which basically means everybody would benefit. But that's the challenge that a lot of half of their customers don't want to pay for it. They, they, they want the free version. So, so is, is it is it the data? Is it the piracy? Is it customer behavior? Is it the entry of new artists? You know, what if, if there is a problem? What's causing? I guess is is the question that we as academics would want to answer. That's a good question. All right, let's take one more question, and then I'm sure they'll be around for the reception afterwards to answer anything that we don't have. Um, Back in there. And you just mentioned that consumers don't want to pay for content, they'd rather get it free. I'm just wondering whether the industries have looked at um, or exploring the developing social norm um, that we consumers voluntarily pay about $30 billion a year to waiters and waitresses. Um, plus other service industries where we've been taught it's the right thing to do, so we feel compelled to do it. Um, that way, if 
copyright is weakened, you still have a business model. Um, and arguably, with a waiter and waitress, you're just feeling guilty. You're not trying to encourage them to stay in the business. But if you like an artist, voluntarily paying is going to help them stay in the business and produce more stuff for you. So there's even some self-interest. So I mean, I think I'm not a psychologist, but I think with the wait waiter and waitress, they are in person that you can see. Yeah. And you know, but you, when you're consuming content on the internet and you're anonymous and the person is anonymous, I think our that thing just weakens a lot. In fact, we are actually running, we, we are in the process of running an experiment where some of those things are, you know, we are kind of, one of those conditions is exactly that, that people are trying to get content for free or in French and then but the way shame them a little bit. You're not going to see them again. They don't see your tip until you've left. Whereas the artist, you want to continue a relationship. You want them to produce more stuff. But you should have a greater incentive but that, and that's that's the question we're trying to answer in the research is what what is the best messaging to convince Kevin not to see? Is it that you're hurting Taylor Swift because I know he's a big Taylor Swift fan? Is it that you're you're a bad person? Is it that I'm going to sue you and take you to jail? You know what what is the right messaging to convince him to change change his evil ways? So some of the, I think some of the artists actually did try. Like was it Radiohead? Or yeah. even you know who said, well, I'm just going to release my album, and you decide how much is it worth. No, but, you, but an industry-wide teaching us to develop this social norm. I, I don't know how the restaurant industry did it, but it's not one route. One restaurant said, we're going to do it. Yeah. No, I, Louis C.K. is another example, right? He releases a, a, a show on his own website and, and basically says, I'm not going to put any DRM on this. Please don't steal it. And some people still stole it, but I think if you were a Louis C.K. fan, you probably didn't. Um, I know I didn't. Okay, and uh, with that, we'll wrap, but they'll be around for, for more. Um, and we, we have a few books to give away. We're giving priority to anybody who tells us that, that they really enjoy the talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we should have done this earlier, but thank you, Scar, thank yeah. you, DPI, thank you, Eric, and thank you, all of you, for spending you know your precious time with us, and, and we appreciate it. Hopefully it was, you found it out for that. <laughs>